This episode of Outlines contains descriptions of a crime which some listeners may find distressing. So as always, discretion is advised. Welcome back to part two of the Patreon-exclusive Yarmouth Beach murder episodes. I hope by now most of you will have had a chance to listen to the first part, but if you haven't yet, make sure you do so, because otherwise this episode might not be very easy to follow, especially because it's been relatively complex to piece together, and there are lots of different strands to this case. For those of you who have listened, but need a quick recap, last month's episode ended with Herbert Bennett being transported by police to Great Yarmouth, where he was charged with the murder of his wife Mary, who had been found strangled with a mohair bootlace on Yarmouth Beach on September 23rd, 1900. Mary and her young daughter had been lodging at the Rudrum's boarding house nearby, under the name Hood, and it took almost a month and a half for Mary's real identity to be discovered and police to close in on her husband, Herbert Bennett, as her murderer. At the start of the last episode... I led with the hanging of Herbert Bennett, and told you that for some he is an innocent man, convicted by the newspapers even before his trial opened at the Old Bailey in February of 1901. For others, his guilt is irrefutable, and for the rest, there just isn't anything new with which to prove he didn't commit the murder. Remember, when you listen to this episode and make up your own minds as to what happened, that my research comes directly from those papers and articles written before and during the trial. As with all the cases I cover, where possible I've tried to ascertain what is fact and what is embellishment. But the older a case, the more liberties journalists were encouraged to take as they wildly furnished their articles with speculation and competed with each other for the most scandalous and compelling stories. Despite the extensive coverage that Mary's murder and the subsequent trial received, it's sometimes difficult to know what was fact and what was fiction, with both being presented in the same way. As you'll hear, the Bennets were not your traditional couple. Their life together was filled with schemes, scams and lies, and in many ways, the truth of it all was probably stranger than fiction anyway. I'm Jess Carter, And this is a Patreon-exclusive episode of the Outlines podcast. this old, sometimes it's difficult to find biographical information. Records can be lost or mistyped when transferred online. Maybe spellings change or a name is just too common. So, I'll preface this next part by saying that, to the best of my knowledge, Mary Jane Clark was born on the 28th of August 1877 in North Fleet in Kent. Her father William was a bricklayer and general labourer, and her mother, also called Mary, died in 1879, two years after the birth of her daughter. Following her mother's death, Mary lived from the age of four with her grandmother, Amy, in North Fleet at 24 Dock Row, and that same year, 1881, her father remarried to a woman ten years his junior. Together, he and his second wife would go on to have nine children. Despite this, or perhaps because of her father's marriage, Mary appears to have spent all her childhood with her grandmother and her grandmother's husband, Edward, and the family appears to have owned a long-standing butchery business on Dock Row. While growing up, she reportedly learned to play both violin and piano, and as a child, she was good enough to take part in local concerts using a valuable antique violin given to her by her grandfather. By the mid-1890s, Mary was giving music lessons in her community, 
and it was through this that she met Herbert Bennett, who was two years younger than Mary and at the time worked as a grocer's assistant in the North Fleet Cooperative stores. It was 12 months after their meeting that Mary confessed to her grandmother that she was secretly engaged and carrying Herbert's baby. Her grandmother insisted that the two should marry and they did so on July 22nd or 23rd in 1897 at West Ham Registry Office. Mary was 21 years old and Herbert just 19. For unknown reasons, on the marriage certificate their ages are swapped with Mary being recorded as the younger of the two. Also, according to reports, Herbert's father's Christian names were given wrong. Following the wedding, the couple reportedly honeymooned in Great Yarmouth, according to Mary's father, at least. There is a photograph available online of Mary and Herbert, and it shows them in a formal portrait, shot at 26 King Street in Yarmouth. In this photo, Herbert, who looks very young, stands next to his seated wife. Attached to his waistcoat is what looks like a pocket watch on a chain. Mary, who was taller than Herbert, is sitting down. She's wearing a black, corseted dress, with one arm resting on the back of her chair. She too looks very young, but her eyes, which are slightly hooded, have a faraway look to them as she stares past the lens. Herbert, in comparison, looks straight towards us. It's difficult to glean too much information from a photograph like this. Remember that back in the Victorian period, the time it took for a photograph to be taken was relatively long by today's standards, and often people were told to stay still and not smile in an effort to reduce blur which could account for their seriousness. However, the newly married couple also had several sad and stressful events which would plague them throughout their short lives. Not long after their wedding, their child was stillborn in what is described mysteriously in one newspaper as an accident. Following their marriage, they lived together for a short while with Amy, Mary's grandmother, whose husband Edward had died a few years previous. Herbert was reportedly out of work at the time, and according to one paper, he spent his days in the marshes shooting small birds. In 1898, though, following Amy's death, they moved to East Ham, and from there to Stockwood Street in Battersea, where Herbert opened a general-purpose store. Sometime around then, I can't be sure on the exact timeline, Mary gave birth to a daughter, Ruby Elizabeth Bennett. An interview with William Clark, Mary's father, from November the 11th, 1900, just five days after Herbert's arrest, tells more about the young couple's relationship, though it's also important to remember that William had just discovered his daughter had been murdered and that her husband was arrested for the crime. It's difficult to know whether he would have felt compelled to embellish Herbert's character in order to ensure his eventual conviction. The way William tells it, his son, also William, who was aged 12 at the time, was employed by Herbert at the general store to carry goods. William Jr. alleged that Herbert and Mary Bennett were often unhappy and that Herbert treated his wife very badly. Both Williams claimed that Herbert always carried a gun and that on one occasion he pointed it at his wife's face in play and pulled the trigger. The gun was empty, save one bullet. Mary and William Jr. begged Herbert to stop, and eventually he put down the gun. The elder William told the paper that Herbert's business soon began to struggle, and one day he appeared at Dock Row, where William Sr. now resided trying to persuade him to hand over a piano which had been bought for Mary by her grandparents. William, sensing that Herbert wanted to sell the instrument, refused to part with it, and Herbert, who was short of temper, became violent and pulled out his gun. William Sr. claimed that Herbert said, Look here, this is what I have brought down specially for you, as he pointed the gun at his wife's father's face. 
William's wife, Selina, sensed the danger and grabbed Herbert, and after a struggle, she and her husband overpowered him. Eventually, Herbert left, and William claimed that following the argument, he went to the magistrates and obtained a warrant against his son-in-law. That was two years prior to Mary's death, and as a result of the altercation, he never saw Mary or Herbert or their daughter Ruby, who was just one month old, at their final meeting again. Following this, the couple and their young daughter seem to have lodged nowhere for very long, and there is no mention of the grocery business, which appears to have been unsuccessful. I apologise for this next part. It's important, but a bit of a challenge to keep all the facts in your head, as there's plenty of places, dates and confusion surrounding the couple's movements. Firstly, I can find them living at 216 Wandsworth Bridge Road in Fulham in January of 1899. Then, by September of the same year, they are registered in Rossiter Road in Balham. Following that, they next appear on February the 23rd, 1900, when Mr G Hitchin of Lloyd's Bank, Westgate-on-Sea, claimed that Herbert came into the bank to cash a cheque for £20. A little under a month later, on the 17th of March, the couple, minus their daughter Ruby, sailed from London on a ship called the Gaika, which was bound for South Africa. They travelled second class under the name Hood, arriving in Cape Town on the 10th of April. We can be relatively sure that, despite the assumed name, this was indeed Herbert and Mary who took the voyage. Six days later, the couple, still under the name Hood, started their return journey to London, where they arrived on May the 9th, 1900. There is nothing recorded which tells us why they travelled to Cape Town, and it has since been speculated, with no evidence, that perhaps while the Boer War raged, Herbert, who soon after his return to England, or perhaps just before his departure, procured a job at Woolwich Arsenal, and could have been to South Africa on some kind of dubiously vague spy mission. Sticking to those things we can be relatively certain on. We know that after their return, they spent a week or so at the house of a Mrs Louise Padkin in Waltham Green. Mrs Padkin told the court in evidence that Mary had stayed with her for a week, and Herbert less than that. They did not have Ruby with them at the time, and they told her that they'd recently visited South Africa. Following this, it's claimed that they spent around a month living at 64 Wickham Lane in Plumstead. Speaking at Herbert's trial, Mrs Emma Elliston, wife of a police constable, told the Old Bailey that the couple engaged two rooms at her home. Herbert arrived first, and a couple of days later, Mary appeared with their child and a parcel in hand. Mrs Elliston claimed in court that Herbert asked Mary why she was late and abused her. She said that he treated his wife very badly and that she was always crying. On one occasion, she claimed that he had hit her in the face. Emma Elliston was of a particularly curious nature and had a habit of listening to her lodger's conversations. She claimed that she had heard Herbert tell Mary that he would find himself a room in Woolwich because he no longer wanted to live with her. On another occasion, she overheard Mary pleading with Herbert to love their daughter, to which he swore at her. Mary told him, I shall follow you for the sake of the baby, and if you are not careful, I can get you 15 years. He reportedly replied, I wish you were dead. If you are not careful, you soon will be. Emma said that Mary was always well-dressed, her underclothing was good quality, with lace on, and that her purse was well filled with gold. As to her character, she told the court that Mary would sometimes alter her stories. At the trial, there was plenty of anecdotal evidence about the couple's marriage and their dealings. Speaking about their time spent at Rossiter Road in Balham the previous year, Mrs Cato, who also lodged at the same address, told the Old Bailey that Mary Bennett's habits were what she described as not a good wife's habits. 
She elaborated on this, saying she did not look after the child well. Its clothes had been allowed to become very dirty. When Herbert Bennett's toe was very bad, she did nothing for it, and she was constantly asking for money. I know this is the first mention of it, but keep Herbert's bad toe in mind. We'll come back to it because it does play a part later on in the narrative. Mrs. Cato also told the court that Mary had told her, I should be sorry for the fools I have taken money from. This statement appears to be in reference to a side hustle that the couple seem to have been running, which involved the trade of counterfeit or stolen violins. There are several references to this peppered throughout the trial, and it does appear as if, at points before and after Herbert's general purpose store, the two were involved in several illegal money-making schemes. Following their time at Wickham Lane in Plumstead, the couple quickly moved again, this time to 30 Woolwich Road in Bexley Heath. The dwelling was smallish, and the couple procured it with a fake reference written by Herbert Bennett under the name W.A. Phillips. The reference read, Dear Sir, at Mrs. Bennett's request, she tells me it is your wish that I should give her this reference to give to you personally. She has been my tenant for a period of five years at £36 a year, and I have found her to be a respectable and careful tenant, and I can thoroughly recommend her as a suitable and responsible tenant to you at the rate she mentioned to me of eight shillings per week. Soon after renting this property, reportedly under the name Bartlett, not Bennett, in July of 1900, they moved again through the same letting agent, this time to a house at number one Glencoe Villas in Bexley Heath, where they paid an advance of half a quarter's rent. By this point, there's evidence that Herbert was living separately from Mary, Ruby and their dog at 41 Union Street in Woolwich, where he shared a room with another lodger, a man named Albert Eardley. As for Mary, she was left to explain his absence to the landlord, saying that Herbert was a seafaring man. The couple appear, at this point in their marriage, to be living almost entirely separate lives. And it is here that we begin to see the extent of the lies told by both, whether for self-preservation, reputation, or out of necessity. It's not clear whether or not Mary was party to Herbert's reason for absence, but it transpires that on the 1st of July 1900, he met and claimed to fall in love with a young woman named Alice Meadows. Alice was a parlour maid at Bayswater, an area within the city of Westminster, and Herbert told her he was a grocer and dealt violins, and that he had been to South Africa on holiday. Naturally, he did not mention Mary, and instead referred to himself as having a cousin in Bexley Heath. This was a similar story to that which he told his landlady, Mrs. Pankhurst, in Union Street. He said that he was a single man, and referred only occasionally, on receipt of news via telegram, to his cousin. There's some confusion in articles as to whether Herbert was implying that Mary was his cousin, or that she was his cousin's wife. And I don't know whether that has just been confused by journalists, or if Herbert himself changed parts of the scenario, depending on who he was talking to. July continued, and while Mary and Ruby stayed in Bexley Heath, Herbert, who was miraculously still employed at Woolwich Arsenal, made plans to take Alice away with him on holiday. On the 30th of July, he wrote to the Rudrums in Great Yarmouth and asked if they had any rooms available. They said no, and instead Herbert and Alice took a first-class carriage to Yarmouth, where they stayed at the Crown and Anchor, next to the Town Hall, the place where, just under two months later, Mary would stand as she waited for her fateful appointment with her murderer. William Reed, who was employed at the hotel, remembered the couple, saying that they stayed there over the August bank holiday. Following straight on from their trip to Yarmouth, Herbert and Alice journeyed again, this time to Ireland, where they spent two weeks travelling the country. Herbert, who would take almost three weeks off sick from work over this time, reportedly spent money freely, 
Whilst away in Ireland, Herbert and a blissfully unaware Alice became engaged. Alice Meadows would later tell the old Bailey that over the course of their relationship, he was gentle and kind, and that the two gradually became more fond of each other. She said that Herbert never took advantage of her, and behaved like a gentleman. As we move into August and September of 1900, there is evidence that Herbert was concocting stories about his wife's health, or the health of his cousin, depending on who he was talking to. In August, he visited her, afterwards telling people that she was his cousin and was quite ill. Also in August, he told William Henry Parry, a worker at the Woolwich Cooperative stores where Herbert had briefly worked, that he had lost Mary and Ruby in South Africa through fever. This revelation must have come as quite a shock to William, who had known both Herbert and Mary even before they were married. Also in August, on receipt of a telegram, he told his landlady Mrs Pankhurst that his cousin in Bexley was very ill. He rushed out on a bicycle and came back the following day, minus the bike, but with a woman's umbrella. He told her that his cousin was stricken with the flu and was not expected to recover, but that she was going to South Africa. There is some evidence that Mary was indeed ill at the time, and this was probably the inspiration for Herbert's many tales of his sick cousin, as well as the convenience of being able to keep up his charade as a single man and still being able to visit his wife. In mid-September, he brought Alice to his home on Union Street, where he introduced her to his landlady, Mrs Pankhurst, as his intended wife. Despite his new engagement to Alice Meadows, it appears as if the looming presence of his still very much living, and by September of 1900, very much healthy wife, was bothering Herbert. So what was Mary doing while her husband was off with his very new and very unsuspecting fiance? The answer is that, unfortunately, for the most part, we don't know. There is evidence that when Herbert stopped by for visits, the two would argue about money. He was giving her what he wanted to spare, not what she needed for herself and their young daughter. Despite this, she began to make arrangements for her trip to Yarmouth, on the 14th of September, the day before she left, Herbert was seen by a neighbour calling on Mary in the morning. After he departed, she went out with a neighbour's sister and purchased a blouse and a veil before having dinner with both the neighbour and their sister. At the trial, fierce arguments were centred around whether or not Herbert knew of Mary and Ruby's upcoming trip, a claim which he denied. There was talk that he had gone so far as to accompany Mary to Yarmouth, a claim backed up by William Reed of the Crown and Anchor Hotel, who said he remembered her but staying there on the night of the 15th of September, a week before Mary's murder. It's important to know, though, that not only had William already seen Herbert's photo in the papers before he was called in to identify him, but that he also already knew of two of the other men present in the lineup. Having said that, it is recorded that Herbert took the 15th of September off work, again claiming illness, and that no one in London could vouch for his whereabouts that day. At trial, his lawyer Edward Marshall Hall would scoff at the evidence, calling it not strong enough to hang your hat on. Regardless of whether or not she was accompanied, Mary readied the house for her absence and on the 15th of September, she and Ruby locked up and left, taking with them a small bag and parcel. Herbert, on the other hand, was definitely in London a day later, because he appeared in Stepney at the house of Alice Meadows' mother to take her sons to the river, reportedly a regular Sunday occurrence. She claimed to remember that day because his suit was marked in iodine, which he said was for his bad toe. It is now that we reach the final few days of Mary's life. While she was in Yarmouth, spending the evenings out and visiting the beach during the day, Herbert was busy working. He definitely turned up for his shifts on Tuesday the 18th through to Friday the 21st of September, though 
there is some confusion as to the times of these shifts. On September the 20th, Alice Meadows testified, Herbert told her that his grandfather was ill and he needed to go down and see him in Gravesend, so he wouldn't be around on that Sunday, the 23rd. On Saturday the 22nd of September, Mrs Pankhurst gave evidence that Herbert departed her house, saying he was going to catch a train. Her story included the convenient fact that she remembered he was holding a timetable in his hands as he told her this. He was reportedly wearing a light grey suit and Mrs Pankhurst remarked upon it because he never wore a suit on a Sunday while visiting Alice and her family, so it stuck out as unusual. While there is no evidence that Herbert caught the train, several witnesses placed him at the Crown and Anchor in Great Yarmouth that evening, the same hotel he'd stayed at with Alice Meadows a month earlier. Edward Goodrum, boots at the hotel, claimed that later that evening, around midnight, Herbert came in out of breath, telling him that he'd missed the tram and had had to walk from Galston. He got to bed and told the man he was due to leave on the 720 train the next morning. Edward Goodrum would later pick Herbert out from a lineup, and again, there is no guarantee that the process was fair and impartial. By 1pm on the Sunday, Whilst Mary's body lay in the mortuary, Herbert arrived in the park where he usually spent the afternoon with Alice and her family. Alice remembered being surprised by this, because she had assumed he would not make the rendezvous, as to her knowledge he was still in Gravesend visiting his sick grandfather. His absence from home the previous evening was confirmed by Mrs Pankhurst, who was in the habit of sending up a cup of tea to Herbert in the mornings. Her son dutifully took the cup up, but apparently returned down a moment later, saying that no one was there. Their other lodger, a man named Stevens, was also absent the previous evening, and again, at trial, there was some confusion as to which of the two were missing that night, if, indeed, either were there at all. This is where I'm going to leave today's episode. My apologies for the sudden ending, but as with part one, I just have too much to fit into a reasonable length episode. Don't worry though, I won't leave you for ages before releasing the final part. It's fully written and will be out early next month if everything goes according to plan. I hope you're finding this unexpectedly deep dive into the murder of Mary Jane Bennett interesting, and I look forward to hearing what you think of it all after the completion of part three. Thanks everyone for your continued support of Outlines. My apologies to those new patrons who I have yet to shout out in an episode. I shall do so as soon as I can, and on that note, watch out on your main feeds for a special collaborative episode of the show with Caprice from the Unseen podcast, which will hopefully be out on the 6th of July. This episode of Outlines was researched, written, performed and produced by Jess Carter. The music was composed by Elias Harding.